Okay, so I'm going to have a, have a quick look at hailstones. Um, hopefully it'll be quick, I won't go on too long. But you never know with me, I tend to get overexcited. I'll try and keep it fairly um, short, anyway. <coughs> so, uh, hailstones um, makes use of a, an extended metaphor, um, which, as you know, seems to... Um, the, the storm the hailstone storm seems to trigger um, memories and it seems to be um, an extended metaphor for um, sort of painful memories in this case that seem to be associated with school and growing up and so that theme of growing up and loss of innocence and all that kind of stuff which you've seen before seems to come out in this um, but this is um, a later poem from the collection called The Whore, Mount, uh, the Whore Lantern and I think it was 1987 so when you're thinking about you know the things like Death of a Naturalist you're going way back to 19, you know, 20 years before that or more 20, 25 years before that so this is um, a representation of how that theme I suppose has in this poem, how that theme has developed, and how it's changed in some ways as it as the poet gets older. There is also uh, religious, as there often is, religious um, ideas and issues in this poem. And if, if you think about this idea of hailstones, immediately you got that word hail. Now we know what it means: hail Mary, full of grace. Um, and I think there's that uh, deliberate connotation there of something um, to do with religion. And uh, we said he we went to uh, a fairly, would have been a pretty strict and fairly brutal Catholic school, private, um, sorry, boarding school, and run by Christian brothers who would rather sort of beat the scriptures into children. And so when you, you think of hail and you think of it in terms of you know the religious connotation as in hail mary and then and you think of then hail stones now he's used stones before hasn't he in the in um poems like punishment where he talks about that biblical story of you know um let he is without sin cast the first stone the idea of stoning something um as a kind of religious punishment and and this it seems to be all about punishment in a way as well, punishing of a child. Anyway, it begins with uh, just the description of the storm itself. My cheek was hit and hit. So we get the repetition there that it seems to be relentless. Um, but the repetition suggests that it's relentless. And again, that would perhaps link back to his childhood and the way in which he was treated in school. Um, Sudden hail stones pel pelted and bounced on the road. And also, it, obviously, there's phonology there to suggest the storm itself. Um, so the physical force of the hailstones is important. Um, and it suggests that the speaker is at their mercy. Um, and they are also... There's a suggestion of personification there as well. Um, um, as if there's nothing you do about it. Um, and he uses a lot of plosive sounds in the d, k, t, t, um, p, t, d, b, d, d. So, lots of plosives to help um, to, to evoke the speaker's helplessness um, and to you know allow us as, a, as an audience to hear the sounds of the, the hailstone storm um, and that runs through the poem in many we get other you know hard ball this is monosyllabic mm, syllabic words that run through it and and then we've got to try and interpret that. So there's no interpretation really to be done there in that first, because it just that first answer, because it just seems to be a straightforward description of um, 
of the storm. But there is that suggestion of being hit, we often use that word, um, to, to mean, you know, physically assaulted and punched or slapped or whatever. And um, so there's that beginning to hint at sort of persecution in a way. But when it cleared, we're told something whipped and knowledgeable had withdrawn. And there's all kinds of ways you could interpret that. Whipped, again, uh, we've got the plosive sounds, by the way, but whipped suggests something like abuse, doesn't it? Um, something that's being punished, because a whip is used for punishment, often used in that kind of way. Um, so that would fit in with the idea of um, corporal punishment in schools and his school. Um, but when it was when it cleared, one assumes that means when he's left school and when that kind of he's no longer going through that kind of thing. Whatever's left, or rather, something sort of goes, something leaves him, and the thing that's left him was knowledgeable. Um, and I think this is the idea of sort of certainty, the certainty of childhood, the certainty of um, unquestioning religious belief, uh, unquestioning faith, and brought up in that sort of very Catholic upbringing, there would be no question of people, you know, thinking about whether it's all true or not. You know, they, that was taken for granted that, you know, the, the, the scriptures were true and you didn't question it, and there, was a, and there is also always a certain comfort to be had in certainty, in knowing. Well, that's, that's you know, I'm sure of it. Now, that fits quite nicely in later with the reference to Thomas Traherne. He, just as he talked about things being perfect at first, but then in no time turning to dirty slush, he says Thomas Traherne had his orient weight for proof and wonder. And the Orient Wheat is a reference to, to him, well, one of his um, meditations he, that, he's, that Thomas Traherne wrote. So, when you think of it in this way, of the, the, the very much a sort of death of a naturalist or a blackberry picking type of idea of things as a child being perfect, so that's the sort of childhood um, innocence and then that innocence being corrupted or turned dirty by just knowledge and not a knowledge of you know the adult world whatever that might be and that might be sexual or whatever you know anything that seems to to take you away from childhood that fits in very much with Thomas Traherne's kind of idea so if you look at this I'd showed you this in class, but um, it tells you about him. He was a clergyman and he was an Anglican, so he was on the other side of the religious divide from um, Heaney. Um, let me go back to the beginning. And there's the quotation. The corn was orient and immortal wheat, which never should be reaped nor was ever sown. I thought it had stood from everlasting to everlasting. So that's the reference, and it's 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 a part of um, a longer piece of writing, which we'll see later. Anyway, there he is, Anglican dude around the Reformation, um, very much strongly Anglican, and not a big fan of Roman Catholicism and its corruption at the time, and papism and that sort of thing. Um, and it says, I've got this from various different websites, but his writings frequently explore the glory of creation and what he perceived as his intimate relationship with God. His writings convey an ardent, almost childlike love of God. And here's a, a part of a poem. Oh joy, oh wonder and delight, oh sacred mystery. You can see it's very sort of celebratory of God and God as a son, friend, friend of God, the idea of being sort of bathing in God's light, and you see by this uh, representation of him there, which is a stained glass window somewhere, can't remember where, um, 
and this light is sort of mystical, mysterious, metaphysical light, but it's a it's a a place, a bower of bliss which would suggest sort of protection and love and so it's a very, very positive and quite as I say, childlike in the sense of very, very innocent in a way, his his view of God. There's no questioning, there's no sense of wondering, you know, what God's mission is or God's what do you call it? I don't know, God's meaning and God's um direction or, or what do God what direction God wants to take you in. He doesn't question any of that. Anyway. In the spirit of the gospel, Strahern's great theme is the visionary innocence of childhood. So this takes us back to childhood. And his writings suggest that adults have lost the joy of childhood, and with it an understanding of the divine nature of creation. Trahern seems to convey the idea that paradise can only be rediscovered and regained through acquiring this childlike innocence, a state which precedes the knowledge of good and evil, and seems to be composed of a boundless love and wonder. So boundless, you know, completely without boundary, um, love and wonder. And you can see in this poem, which is called Innocence, I've missed huge bits out, and you can watch, you can see the rest of it here on this link if you want, but... Uh, no darkness then did overshade, but all within the pure and bright. No guilt did crush, nor fear invade, but all my soul was full of light. So that's the idea of childhood. No guilt, no fear, uh, light everywhere, no darkness. And then it, towards the end he says, an antipast of heaven, like a foretaste of heaven. So being a child was a foretaste of heaven, sure. I on the earth did reign, within without me was all was pure, I must become a child again. So he's thinking that oh, that was the best time that was the most innocent time and he wants to sort of return to that in a way to link with God so and he also talked about nature he saw God illuminated in nature the infinity of God magnifies all things he says every spire of grass is the work of, of his hand an ant is a great miracle and the sweetness and unusual beauty of trees makes his soul almost mad with ecstasy and the idea was that when we're children we have a capacity to be ravished by the wonder, beauty and liveliness of the natural world, but then we lose our amazement through custom and familiarity. And there's more to see about that there on this blog that I've got that from. And I can set down here, I hope you can see how this view of nature might tie in with Heaney's earlier poems like Death of Naturalist. So, although, I mean, Heaney sort of used it, and many poets have taken that idea of, of the innocence of childhood and closeness to nature and how we seem to lose that in the sophistication of adulthood with learning and this, you know, um, our maturity. Um, but <laughs> Heaney sort of writes about the the slop and the, the slap and the squelch of nature, the more sort of revolting things about nature, but with a sense that as a child he um he could appreciate that nature was was a friendly or i don't know quite friendly but certainly fascinating uh, force which seems in death Naturalist, um personal helicon and all these different poems to be a great inspiration to him but then also seems to have a sort of a darkness to it that that Traherne doesn't really identify and this is the a larger piece from um, what's called Century, Centuries of Meditations, Traherne's writing. And you could read it all, but basically that's the quotation. The corn was orient and immortal wheat. Now I've said down here the word orient is used in its old meaning of iridescent or lustrous, one of the several references to luminosity of the world um, described by Traherne. So he often describes light. Light is extremely important, as you'd expect. So... And that's the whole quote and quotation. And then it's at the end, so that with much ado I was corrupted and made to learn the dirty devices of this world, which now I unlearn and become, as it were, a little child again, that I may enter into the kingdom of heaven. So that's his view of God, nature, etc. Right, so when we go back to the poem, you can see this idea of dirtiness again which Trahern just mentioned the the um things being perfect at first again this i think similar idea innocence and then made dirty by the adult world but then we get Thomas Trahern had his orient wheat for proof and wonder but for us 
It was the sting of the hailstones and the unstingable hands of Teddy Diamond foraging in the nettles. So, but for us, now the the dig 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 us there is important. Um, us meaning obviously it's a proximal um, deictic expression um, and proximal and a person deictics deictus isn't it which is inclusive so but also exclusive because it excludes the the other side the Anglican or the Protestant so we, we as Catholics, he says, had the sting of hailstones. Now that's that's the sort of brutal um, treatment that he had at school. That's what it represents, that brutal Christian brothers kind of strict Catholic um, training, I suppose, what we generally call it, that he suffered. Or they suffered us, him and his mates, people like Eddie Diamond. And then this is obviously a, a reference to nature, um, and that almost suggests a kind of unstingable hand that there's so so much kind of pain in a sense in their in their childhood that they became hardened to it. And so there's a contrast there isn't there, in the in the view that Traherne had. Of ch the childhood wonder of nature being something pure and full of light and full of happiness and joy, whereas Heaney's suggests more pain um, and um, this stinging pain, which is the stinging and the smarting he uses earlier. It suggests a kind of burning pain, and that that's the kind of pain you get when somebody hits you with a strap or a cane. Um, and that sort of stinging, because that would sort of fit in with that whole idea of the ruler across the knuckles that we get up here. So if you go with that interpretation of this n this certainty of uh, belief, which was sort of beaten into him as a child, he begins to dr drift away or melt away as he gets older. So it becomes more uncertain. And so it's something that whipped and Mulligan had withdrawn and left me there with my chances. So a, a chance is not certain. So I think that would fit in as well. And from that, these memories and r religious upbringing, he made poetry. I made a small hard ball of burning water running from my hand, just as I make this now out of the melt of the real thing. The melt of the real thing, I think, is the memory. And it seems to me that somehow it's as it's it's burning, so it still hurts this memory, and and but but at the same time he can, uh, 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 it can be triggered by say uh, an episode like this. Suddenly he, it, it, the memory is triggered by this hailstone storm, and when it when the memory comes, it's it's still burning, um, but I think perhaps he's talking about the the idea of inspiration that he has to write um, but it's 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 running from his hand it's almost as if the memory is slipping away um, so he has to write it sort of quickly I suppose but anyway uh, as I make this now so again we get some digs there which just orientates us as to make sure you know that he's talking about now meaning as an adult and he's looking back so the melt of the real thing, I'll say, sorry, was, um, repeating myself here, was um, the memory, I think, of the real thing. And he smarts, he still, this fits in, it still hurts, it's still smarting into its absence. Um, so it's, the absence then, perhaps, is also the absence of this knowledge of certainty. So it's this, this strange, um, kind of paradox where finds the memory painful and therefore obviously at the time it was painful and not much fun at all but at the same time he kind of misses that certainty so 
it smarts the fact that it's not there anymore. He misses that certainty of belief he had as a child. However, he says, you know, that aside, okay, I might miss it, but you know, I, I, they're to be reckoned with. So these these memories, you know, they're they're pretty strong, and they're and they're not to be taken lightly. Uh, and they're brats, which suggests um, obviously he's talking about the, the children, so that fits in. But but the, these memories are almost difficult to control, um, and perhaps selfish, and perhaps unpleasant in a way. That's, well, definitely unpleasant, aren't they? Um, and then the way they refuse permission. Now this could be the idea that if if you know he, he's remembering a ha hailstorms, which meant that he couldn't they couldn't go outside at break time to play and escape the sort of horrible oppressive lessons that they had sat through. They the way they refuse permission, rattling the classroom window like a ruler across knuckles. We've got more of this phonology here, um, which we've talked about to suggest the 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 sound of the hailstones, but there he makes an explicit um, comparison with um, the sort of punishment that he suffered, or the caning, or the strapping, whatever it was that that happened to him. Um, and we've talked about this, haven't we? The idea of this perfection of childhood, um, which then turns later on to slush, which links with Traherne. So I've done that. And and I think proof and wonder wonder obviously was a big part of Traherne's religious belief, but there's 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 a different sort of wonder here, and it's much more kind of based in reality, um, or it's kind of a very grim sort of image here, um, which which is very much the sort of um, way in which. Heaney takes the idea of nature and childhood, that nature can sting you, um, just like the frogs in um, Death and Latrist were um, mud grenades, they were dangerous, and that the, uh, the blackberries and blackberry picking turned um, rotten and nasty and so there's a there's, there's always this, this kind of double edge this paradox of what he's saying he both loved nature and but also um and he loved everything about nature but also there was a, a dark side to it whereas Traherne's view of nature and of god um is just absolutely positive full of light full of wonder and and then there's sense of pr this idea of proof that he, there was certainty there, but, and this, you know, this conjunction is highlight foregrounded by being the start of the stanza and the, and the, the enjambment foregrounds it. Um, for them, that there was no such proof really. You know, it wasn't the the proof came out of pain, the the, the pain of the punishment that they, they were they were told. You know all. They had to believe, and they had to have faith, or somebody did thrash him with a with a stick. Um, and so this is this is the dark side of nature, which is which is what he he often is concerned with. And then something else he does, which is kind of weird, but he's done it before, is to then mix up sort of sexuality and um, pain. And I think the, the bite lumps is very much like love bite. And I think that's deliberate. Um, and nipple is clearly sexual, and there's a comparison there with small acorns. I think that's deliberate. But a hive is an itchy, hot, or rash. Now the heat of sexuality is implied there. So there's almost the, 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 this continuum again. This dichotomy, this paradox of both loving something and hating something comes out pleasure and pain in this case so he's constantly pulling these two th sort of di um, ideas these divergent ideas together 
um, intimated is to suggest something so the suggestion of as he as he goes into adolescence and I think that's the time he's remembering because that's the time he would have been strapped and caned in secondary school um, he remembers again the pleasure possibly of you know the first hints of sexuality which again if you think of you know, I'm sorry to be explicit, but things like masturbation was a venal sin and would have been, you know, something that uh, boys, I imagine, would have indulged in but have felt very, very guilty about afterwards. So it may have been pleasurable, but it was also painful because it was disallowed. It was suggested by their bodies, I suppose, but disallowed by... The, the Christian brothers by by their faith, which says, you know, that's a venal sin, that's not allowed, you can't have impure thoughts, you can't uh, sully, dirty your God, you know, the, the innocent and pure body that God gave you. And when the shower ended, and everything said, wait, you know, and this is a difficult bit, for what? For 40 years to say there, there you had the truest foretaste of your aftermath. In that dilation, when the light opened in silence and a car with wipers going still lay perfect tracks in the slush. So I suppose, he's, is he asking the question, you could interpret it as saying, well, what was that all for? What was all, all that repression and that oppression and that religious stuff all about? Um, what, Forty years later, I suppose, when he's writing this poem, um, and when he looks back on that experience and his childhood and his relationship with nature and all those things, um, he sees that he had a, a foretaste of of what it was to be um, adult. In that, this idea of the uncertainty of existence, that nothing is actually certain, and in that. In, in, in that childhood he had that foretaste of it and the dilation seems to be the opening of the sky so the, the as the clouds part the, the, the sun comes in and this is you know the sort of more like a Traherne type of image of light and heaven when light opened in silence and car and a car with wipers going still laid perfect tracks in the slush um, you, also I think your aftermath might might be death perhaps and then and perhaps the light opening is a bit is is a more optimistic view or or an image of heaven um and the car wipe is still going and laid perfect perfect tracks in the snow so that perfection seems to somehow have returned um, and he t uses the word perfect before when he says that they, they, they were perfect first so these perhaps the childhood memories were perfect at first but then they turned to dirty slush but then down here at the end the, the tracks left by the car which suggests to me the time you know, if the if the journey of the car is his life, and uh, he's going along in his car, let's draw a car. I'm great at drawing. You'll enjoy this. There he is. There's his car. Um, he's got his lights on because it's a bit, a bit of hail, storm, you know, a bit dark. And he's and he's going through the and he's leaving tracks behind. And and so therefore, if this is the future, and this is him now, and this is him as a child, then. Uh, uh, as he's gone through, he's laid these perfect tracks as I, as I've gone along. So perhaps as he's as he's going along, and the the wipers will be clearing his path, or clearing his vision, as it were. They'll be they'll be clearing away um, old sort of differences and discrepancies and things as he tries to see his way forwards uh, with clarity as a writer then perhaps 
when he thinks about it and sort of looks back that, that what he's actually done is create something he's quite proud of so this could be sort of the, the perfection of this the body of work that he produced as a, as a poet and when you think back then to something like digging and he talks about you know and again very very early poem back when he was a young man 25 or something like that he says you know he sets out then and says i'm going to dig and plow you know have plow my own furrow as it were i'm not going to be like my father and grandfather i'm going to be different i'm going to be a writer and i'm going to try and create something artistically that has some value and that i can be proud of and perhaps here we do get that sense of of him saying you know i well i i've i've done it in a way um so it's a tough one to interpret but i think you know you've got to make an effort to do so um and be prepared to write you know as i've told you before to write with a sense of uncertainty to write to say well perhaps it's this or perhaps it's that or this image could suggest so and so um, as you're going along in terms of the techniques that you see we talked i talked quite a bit about the plosives and the the use of um, monosyllabic words and things like this but again you, you know you look at bits like i made a small hard ball of burning water you've got you think of the way it's free verse so there's no particular rhythm but it, he does as as he often does exploit the rhythmic qualities of language so when you read this i made a small so you get a, a, a stress here on small hard ball of burning water so in each on each syllable uh, there's a there's a that i've underlined there's a definite sort of pounding rhythm i made a small hard ball of burning water running from my hand and then and then the, there's less stress you can hear on these the sense of being you know of, of something being pounding away um, and something hard and something uncompromising and painful is highlighted by that kind of thing there's this all a lot of enjambment that runs between stanzas um, and I think it gives a, a it gives this poem a sort of uneasiness an uneasy kind of feeling because it it there's no sense in which it sort of allows you to get going as a reader you're constantly being just knocked off balance by it so because as you know the the implications of a small pause as it as as we run from one stanza to the next um when it cleared again something whipped and knowledgeable had withdrawn and left me there with my chances i made a small hard ball of burning water running from my hand just as now i make this out of the melt of the real thing smarting into its absence so you can hear i hope how it how the uh, enjambment there sort of trips up the reader and makes it quite a challenge in a way to read there's lots of personification i mean all the way through this isn't it the whole thing is full of metaphor and of this extended meta the personification of um the storm um is really important for for the meaning where this this technique is, is described as illusion so to allude to something outside of the text and it does add a great deal of um meaning and um, you know it, it it once you know what he's on about then it does really set up that idea of of this the, the difference between the faiths as it were and the way he sees a different way in which um the catholic faith and the perhaps some more idealized innocent sense of this this faith um the protestant faith how different it is